Hello, Dine Sports viewers. Uh, welcome to our breakdown of UFC 290, Volkanovski versus Rodriguez. Here um, from Las Vegas International Fight Week, we have a massive card this weekend. Um, coming to you live Saturday, we're going to see not only the featherweight championship up for grabs, um, a flyweight title as uh, Brandon Moreno looks to make yet another title defense. And um, this is a great card full of uh, high-level prospects below it. Very excited to watch. Um, as always, Nick, joining me to break down the card. How are we doing today? Good, man. Really, really strong card here. Um, I know after this, we get a couple not-so-strong cards in the weeks to follow. So really want to key in on this one, make sure we're making our best bets. But lots of name value from top to bottom. They're certainly trying to build some prospects here. A lot of wide lines, um, but at the same time, I do think we can use some of those guys as parlay pieces. So uh, really excited to dig into this one with you. Yeah, uh, it's going to be a great card, starting right at the top. Uh, the featherweight main event, which I'm pumped about. I mean, whenever Alexander Volkanovsky is fighting, it's really must-see. Um, he's established himself one of the best in the UFC right now. That fight last time out against Islam Makachev was super close. Um, you know, even upon re-watching, it's tough to say who really deserved to win that one. But just the way Volkanovsky fought, um, you know, up at lightweight against one of the best, most dominant wrestlers there is there. Um, it, it does give me confidence as he moves back down to featherweight, defending the title he has really without issue for the past couple of years. Um, yeah, he is a tough opponent. I mean, the, uh, the dynamic striking from him is obviously going to be the key in this fight. Um, we're going to see him throwing unorthodox attacks, really opening up on the feet as he has, um, especially a lot recently. Um, you look great in that win, uh, to secure the interim title fighting Josh Emmett. Um, but I mean, Emmett isn't quite the level of, uh, the, these top contenders at 145, in my opinion. Um, I think Yair is very legit, but I just see him having trouble with Volkanovski here based on the defense that the champ has shown, um, when it comes to, you know, kickboxing exchanges on the feet. And, uh, if you're throwing all these looping wild attacks, Volkanovski is somebody with just incredible fight IQ that's going to capitalize, going to look to score takedowns off of, you know, kicks he catches, things of the sort. Um, you know, win this fight using his strength. He, he's going to have the advantage over Yair in terms of sheer power, in terms of, uh, you know, the ability to control this fight. And whether that's against the cage, on the mat, um, I see him earning uh, a lot of, you know, winning minutes in those grappling exchanges and, um, you know, keeping this a, a tight fight on the feet. I mean, Yair is a very good striker. I, I don't think it's crazy to say he's better than Volkanovski in terms of just pure kickboxing. But what Volk's been able to do on the feet to these guys, um, even if it's a bit more basic, a bit more rudimentary than some of the attacks you'll see coming the other way, um, it's super effective. Volk's a sniper too. And uh, yeah, I, I see Ann still here, him getting his hand raised. Although Yair is a, um, an intimidating opponent. Yeah, it is a really fun matchup. I'm with you. I do agree Volk's aside. I think he's the better all-around fighter. Um, I don't totally agree that... Yair is a better kickboxer, so to speak, but I will say Yair's dynamic striking ability certainly could be um, an equalizer, for lack of a better word. I mean, we see some clips on the Embeddeds this week. Um, we've seen some training footage leading into this fight. Just really insane dynamic kicks. I don't know that those are going to be there against Volk, like where he's throwing a right like wheel kick and then landing on his left foot and throwing it back the other direction. Like the things he's doing in the gym are amazing. I don't know that he's going to be able to execute those against a fighter um, at the level of Volkanovski. I will say, I think if he were to get it done, it would probably come from like a timely knockout or maybe like an elbow can cult Volk or some, something crazy like that. But I think outside of that, I mean, Volkanovski's style just really should work well in a matchup like this. Um, Gaier's really good with the kicks, really dynamic dynamic in his striking fights very long um and while he's going to have a reach advantage here certainly i know it's not listed as such he will though uh volk does a really good job and we saw this time and time again against holloway pressuring his opponents getting in their face really taking out that kicking range really making it difficult for yair to be dynamic at all um which really is his bread and butter um so while i do think the line's gotten a little bit out of hand i know i think it's around minus 400 some books i'm gonna pull up the fight odds uh for the rest of this video um it does feel wide, honestly, but at the same time, I mean, Volk's really given us no reason not to think he should be able to get it done here. Um, I disagree in that I, I 
do think Islam beat him pretty clearly, um, three rounds to two in their fight, but that is up a weight class against a wrestler, just a very different matchup than what he's seeing here. Um, while he hasn't seen the type of dynamic striking that Yair is going to present, he has seen similar strengths in opponents um, like a Max Holloway, a guy who can fight really long. Um, and, I mean, Yair's jiu-jitsu continues to improve, and I do think that Volk's dealt with some of that against someone like Ortega. So I... I don't know. There's something about Yair. He's one of these young fighters that seems to improve dramatically every time he's in there. Like four or five years ago, I would have never kind of considered this guy a future champion, but I don't know. He continues to prove me wrong. He's got himself in this position now, um, but he's taking on arguably one of the best pound for pound fight, or arguably the best pound for pound fighter in the UFC in Alexander Volkanovsky. Um, I don't know. I just think Volk's style of pressure should be enough to get it done here. Slowly break Rodriguez, whose cardio looked great in that Holloway fight. Um, but at the same time, I mean, Max kind of played with his food a little bit in that one. I think Volk can take a lot from that performance from Yair, which was his best performance. As impressive as he was against Emmett, I don't think that type of style is going to be there for him here. So, um I don't know. I see Volk winning on volume. Like you said, he could score the takedowns if he needs to. He's proven that he can defend against submissions. I mean, training a lot with Craig Jones for this camp once again certainly been a plus. Um, so I'm with you on Volk. Don't love the price. Um, but yeah, it should be a very, very fun main event. Um, and it, I don't think it would shock me if we did see Ayer pull off the upset, but I'm definitely backing Volk here. I'll probably tie him into some parlays in hopes that I could maybe hedge out at the end of the night with someone who's like a plus 300 like Yair. But uh, this should be Volk's fight to win. I do think stylistically, even lacking the reach, um, he should be able to close that distance down. Yeah, minus 370 for Volkanovski at current, plus 290 on Yair. Um, I will be involving Volkanovski in parlays at a price tag like minus 370. Um, probably not playing the inside or anything like that. Certainly a fight I could see Volk winning by decision. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just like yeah, levels as well. I mean, what Volkanovski was able to do to Holloway, what he was able to do to Zombie. Um, you see Yair having very competitive fights with both. Um, I, th I think the matchup with Holloway does zombie, get... Yeah. yeah, I think the matchup with, um, you know, Holloway does... Uh, mirror this one a bit as well J just what Volkanovski is going to be able to do in terms of uh, his striking in the pocket compared to his opponent um, I see him getting his hand raised here today and still agreed all right looking next at the co-main event a flyweight title fight a rematch um, twice now Alexandre Pantoja has beaten Brandon Moreno and he looks to make it three times as he is now fighting for the flyweight belt um, this fight's much more competitive uh, Lee lined minus 210 for the champion Moreno against Pantoja who could be had plus 175 and um, I've been having a real tough time on this one I mean heading into the week Pantoja was going to be the pick for me um, I, I saw what he was able to do to Moreno in the prior bouts and although Moreno's a completely changed fighter since then. I do still give the edge grappling quite, uh, quite heavily in favor of Pantoja. Um, it's just the more you look at Moreno fight, the more you've seen him uh, competing at the high level these past couple times out. His hands really are way more crisp. Um, you're going to see the far better striking combinations coming from Moreno. Um, if he's going to be able to extend this fight as he has in previous title defenses, I think um, we're going to see him winning a majority of the exchanges you know, round by round. Um, thanks to his hands, thanks to his effective striking. I think the key for Pantoja is going to be getting Moreno down early or securing the back very early in this fight. Um, because otherwise, I think that striking is going to cause some separation and um, certainly make it an uphill battle for Pantoja to get into those clinch exchangings uh, that I believe he needs. Um, you know, Pantoja has been on a great run of his own. I think he's certainly deserving of a flyweight title shot. I think, um, he, he's a legit champion. Like the ability that this guy has, his grappling acumen, I, I think does make him a, a real threat at the top of this division. Um, it's just, we also saw Moreno, uh, you know, kind of thrive in the most recent, uh, Figueredo fight, those grappling exchanges caught in a tight guillotine, to, uh, you know, caught in other attempts and still fighting through that. Um, I think while Moreno has been finished before by submission, um, he's going to really uh, play to his strengths here, keeping Pantoja away from him and, um, you know, using notes from those previous matchups that he can't be on his back. He can't be getting controlled this whole time because uh, then the belt will be switching hands. Um, I'm still torn. I, I still, 
lean Pantoja getting the plus money here in this spot, but um, certainly Moreno's a champion I don't want to disrespect, and um, it's hard to pick against him given the run he's been on. Yeah, um, very tough fight to call, certainly should be very competitive. I am actually on the Pantoja side. Um, I mean, agree. The the fighters these guys were, their previous matchups with Pantoja dominated both of, honestly. Um, this is a different Brandon Moreno. At the same time, I do think it's also a different Pantoja. Um, his wrestling's come a long way. Obviously, the better jiu-jitsu player. I also think his striking has come a long way. He's much more dynamic. We've seen improved cardio out of him. Um, and there is something mentally, I think, for Pantoja here, knowing he's beaten this guy twice before, um, knowing over the course of his last several fights that he wanted to be in this position, knowing what he was chasing, knowing that that belt should be on the line. Um, and he's been slated for this title shot for a very long time because Moreno's been in that quadrilogy with Figgy. Um, and I mean, the one fight where he wasn't fighting Figueroa, he did land that timely liver kick on Kai Carter France, but uh, France was ahead on all of the judges' scorecards before that took place. Um, I actually think we could see Pantoja match Moreno on volume. Um, I don't, really see Moreno as a power puncher. I don't necessarily see him putting Pantoja down. Um, so outside of kind of wearing him down and breaking him over the course of five rounds and pulling away late, I actually think Pantoja is going to be the minute winner here as well. And I also see him as the more potent finisher. So I don't know. I agreed with you in that. I don't want to disrespect Moreno as a champion. There's been times in his career where I've under underestimated him before um, in some of those early Figueredo matchups, and he's proven me wrong time and time again. I do like the move under head coach Safe Sayud with Fortis MMA. Um, I think that's a really good fit for Moreno. He's going to have someone yelling, um, giving him really thorough instructions, and Moreno's the type of guy who is going to listen. He's going to follow what his coach says, and Safe is one of the best in the game. Um, but yeah, I mean, for me, Pantoja having that mental edge as a challenger, getting good plus money on him here. Um, I think it's the side for me. And I mean, I've rewatched a lot of the Moreno Figueredo fights. I did go back and watch um, some of the Pantoja Moreno stuff, and I try not to put too much weight into it. But um, not only is it an advantage for Pantoja, but I mean, it's got to be a bit of a hill to climb for Moreno here. I mean, we did see something similar with Izzy and Pereira where he was finally able to get that win back. But um, I don't know. It's not really being talked about as a narrative as much. I think everyone really loves Moreno. He's such a great guy. He's fan favorite. Um, but at the same time, I mean, Pantoja is a violent, violent man. And if you hear him walking out to 50 Cent, I don't care who you are. Um, that's a very, very dangerous flyweight. I think he's the more potent finisher here. I would not be surprised to see him finish Moreno probably via submission more likely than knockout. Moreno does have an outstanding chin. Um, but even if it goes to the scorecards, I think as long as his cardio holds up for five rounds, he can win plenty of minutes here. Um, they have similar volume on the feet, um, pretty similar striking defense. And yeah, he's got his number a bit. So I'm on Pantoja here. I really like the price. I mean, if it was a pick em fight, um, I'd probably look deeper and maybe end up on the Moreno side. But getting a little bit of plus money, that's more than enough for me to to want to back the challenger here. And this is a card full of favorites. It's very tough to find good underdog spots. And I've had this one circled since even before this fight was announced. Yeah, and I mean, I pick on my, I would be going Moreno, but minus 210, it is a different story. Um, yeah, I, I feel like the 53% striking accuracy for Pantoja, it's really going to be tested on the feet. I think Moreno does have the better striking defense. And um, Pantoja, in terms of meaningful shots landing, they, they are going to be kind of few and far between. Um, but yeah, certainly I find him the more likely of these two to finish the fight. And um, yeah, that was my initial lean as well, the way of the underdog getting plus money on a uh, on a very live title challenger. Um, should be a great fight. I'm excited for that one. Um, moving on now to the feature about uh, this a middleweight uh, title eliminator with Robert Whitaker looking to turn back the uh, streaking Drikus du Plessis. Um, a minus 380 favorite at current against uh, Duplessis, who could be had at 3-1. to one. Um, uh, It's pretty clear what this fight's going to be. Whitaker is uh, one of the best, um, a pound-for-pound pound top 10 fighter in my eyes. Um, really well-rounded, just, just great everywhere. Um, supreme knowledge of the sport, mixed martial arts. Facing somebody in Duplessis who's a very explosive, powerful kickboxing um, fighter, somebody who's able to put his hands on you, even if it's not in the most methodical or, um, you know, aesthetically pleasing manner. 
Uh, Whitaker's fun to watch. He's clean. He uses his jab well. He's so clean in and out of distance, landing in combination. Um, that one-two followed by the high kick is a classic of his. Um, I, I see him piecing up Duplessis for a majority of this bout. It's just I'm not going to respect a guy who's been uh, winning me money for quite some time. Um, since joining the UFC, I've been high on Duplessis. He, he really does come from a good promotion um, out out. Uh, from South Africa and fighting KSW, I believe. Um, he is not only going to, um, you know, hold the advantage of power over most middleweights, he seems to be, uh, you know, durable as well, uh, able to take a punch. Although we've seen him rocked and, you know, nearly finished a couple of these recent fights. Um, he does fight through. He does have the cardio, even when it appears, you know, he, he's gasping for air uh, over the course of these fights. We see that, you know, second... Uh, second gear kick on and Duplessis could remain competitive even as uh, fights begin to go late. It's just facing Robert Whitaker, man. He's going to have his hands full. I mean, Whitaker is somebody who gets better as the fight goes on, really locks into his distance, um, know, knows how to attack opponents from range, knows how to score when it's needed. Um, uh, I think he's going to be a step of ahead of Duplessis for as long as this goes. And as much as I'd like to see Duplessis find a finish and, you know, get a shot at Adesanya and in, in, in what's talked about as, um, you know, quite the narrative, um, I, I don't think he really has a good chance at all against Robert Whitaker. I think at minus 380, um, Whitaker is somebody that, you know, I'd involve in a parlay with someone like Volkanovsky, just expecting the better, um, far, far more technical fighter to get his hand raised. Yeah, um, I'm kind of opposite you. I've been down on Duplessis in a lot of these matchups. Um, but yeah, he, he does have that uncanny ability to turn a loss into a win. I mean, did not look great early against Brunson, did not look great early against Till, did not look great early against Tavares, all fights that he won. I mean, he has this uncanny ability um, to put on a blooper reel in some of these fights where he's pulling guys on top of him into guard, um, swinging at air when his opponents are across the cage and still winning fights. I mean, he's a gritty guy very tough very explosive in his athletic ability i don't want to call him like super athletic because he is clunk clunky in his movements it's almost like a i don't know drunken fist type of style but it works for him and i can't deny that it works for him i just think against a technical powerhouse like whitaker um he's not going to be able to do that here and i mean the difference i mean there's some things you can compare to the darren till matchup in this matchup with whitaker um at least on the feet till Super technical, great technician, but Duplessis was consistently able to take him down. Uh, Whitaker, one of the best takedown defenses in the division, around 85%, has dealt with wrestlers time and time again. Uh, Yoro Romero couldn't take him down. I mean, there's just tons of film on him doing well against that type of style. Um, and where we saw Brunson gas out, we saw Till gas out and then quit. Whitaker's built for five rounds. Most of his fights over the past few years have been five rounds. He's going to have the cardio advantage here. And even if Duplessis' nose surgery suddenly allows him to uh, not look like he's dying half the time he's in the cage, um, I don't think that's really going to matter because Whitaker should be able to match his cardio and then some. Um, I mean, Duplessis puts out a lot of volume. But again, against such a great technical striker like Whitaker, who has over 60% defense in the division, that is not necessarily a good thing. Um, I think Rob should win here cleanly. Um, he could pick him apart at distance like he did with Vittori, just really take him to school in terms of striking. And I mean, as good as Duplessis has looked, I mean, the wins aren't aging well at all. I mean, Till's out of the UFC. We saw Tavares get starched by Bruno Silva, a guy whose chin in the past really hadn't been cracked. Um, even the Soldich win for KSW. I mean, Soldich looked terrible for what his last time out, just spamming hooks. I mean, I don't know. But this is one of those guys. I mean, sometimes they're just guys that just win and, it usually happens a little bit longer than you expect it to. For me, this has already taken place longer than I expected it to. You know, Whitaker is one of my favorite fighters. I do think Rob wins here convincingly. Um, I'd rather tie his money line into parlays and bet him inside the distance, just knowing the style of fight that Whitaker usually brings to the cage. Um, but at the same time, I'll probably take a small stab, like maybe half to a quarter unit on the inside and then tie Rob into most parlays. I mean, outside of something crazy happening here, um, I do think Whitaker gets it done. Um, and I love every Everything Rob's been saying going into this fight, I know I'm probably disrespecting Duplessis a little bit more than I should in this matchup, but Rob is not. I mean, he's taking him as seriously as anyone. He looks amazing coming out of camp. Arguably the best shape he's been in um, in the UFC, which is a lot to say from a guy who's always in great shape.
shape. Uh, but he's had a very, very extensive camp. And we recently learned in his media that he asked for this fight um, coming off the Brunson fight where there was a lot of talk between Duplicis and Adesanya. Rob said, hey, uh, is he available? Uh, maybe I can get this one. And they gave it to him. So we got Rob here. Um, line's getting wide, but I think it should. I like him as a parlay piece for sure. Yeah, and I mean, the, the the one thing giving me a bit of pause is just the three-round atmosphere of this fight. If this was five rounds, I think it's Robert Whitaker all day. It's just, um, you know, only three that Duplessis has to uh, make this work, I think, gives him an outside chance, um, just based on, you know, the pace we may see from these two. Whitaker a bit uh, more quick to the action than perhaps usual, but yeah, I, I think it's all Rob Whitaker here, um, probably getting this win and uh, you know, potentially getting a shot to fight Izzy once again in Sydney. Um, moving on now, uh, staying down under with Dan Hooker making a return here, uh, fighting at lightweight against Jalen Turner. Um, Turner favored in this bout minus 280 right now against Dan Hooker, who could be had at plus 230. Um, I've been a big fan of Dan Hooker for quite some time. I, uh, you know, love to see him get his hand raised when he can, but... Um, I think this is a tough spot for him. I mean, this is a good stylistic matchup. Um, we have two lanky strikers um, here in the division. Um, Turner is one of the biggest guys you'll see here. You know, great length. Um, you know, fighting out of the southpaw stance, very effective striking. Um, facing Hooker, who's just proven kickboxing. Um, and really dangerous. Knees up the middle, elbows when he throws them. Um, you know, a, a dangerous striker when he is going to stand in exchange. Um, Turner didn't have the opportunity to really show his striking uh, last time out against, uh, sorry, my, my two Scamrat. Uh, brutal stylistic matchup. I mean, Gamrat just take down, take down, take down, rinse and repeat. That is what he does. Um, it was a split decision. Turner was not able to get his hand raised, but I think this is much more suited to his style, um, fighting somebody like Dan Hooker. And, uh, yeah, it's just Hooker as of late, as much as I want to back him as, you know, a huge dog here. Um, he really has been getting quality wins. Claudio Puelas the last time out, not the best you know, a uh, fighter, I'd, I'd say, um, you know, while the showing was good, uh, I don't think Dan is quite what he was. Um, the defense has been a bit of an issue for me, keeping his chin up, not reacting to shots quite as well when he does get hit. And then uh, just not quite as quick on his, uh, on his feet in terms of, you know, speed and and striking while well moving forward. So I think this is going to be an interesting fight. Fight of the night potential here, these two swinging, trading back and forth. Um, I do lean the way of Turner. I'm, I'm not sure I bet him though at minus 280. I, I don't think Hooker's that far gone. I think he's certainly um, more than live in this spot and what should be a uh, back and forth kickboxing fight yeah i mean i like turner as well and while i think the fans and both of us would love this to be a back and forth kickboxing fight i think the clearest path here for turner is to wrestle i mean he had issues with gamrod and the grappling uh, but we've seen hooker consistently struggle um, to keep fights standing i mean he has a solid 81 percent takedown defense but the reason that number is so high is because he is shot on constantly and i think that claudio Puelles fight certainly boosted his percentage there as well um but yeah i mean turner very long striker for the division most of hooker's success has come from that length at 155 and he's really meeting his match here against the guy in turner who i haven't always been very high on but have been extremely impressed by him recently um hooker does a good job switching stances i think he's going to give turner some tough looks on the feet that he hasn't seen before i actually do expect hooker to win some of the striking exchanges early and look really good um but as the fight starts to wear on. I do see Turner as the much more powerful puncher. Um, and if he is ever getting caught, he can certainly lean on his grappling here. I mean, he does a good job using that frame uh, to take his opponents to the mat. And uh, listening to his media day this week, uh, we learned that he's been training a bunch with Kamza Kamaev. Um, not a ton, just a couple of weeks, but just grappling with a guy like that, uh, even for a little bit of time, is certainly going to have you feeling great about that part of your game. So for me, I like Turner here. I think he will look like the minus 280 or even minus 300 here if he wrestles. If he doesn't, the line is too wide. Um, so I may do a little digging, try to catch a glimpse of his game plan somewhere. I mean, I've already listened to a few interviews, and it seems he's keeping things pretty close to the vest. But I'm thinking, I don't know, he's trying to climb the division now. I mean, if he wins here, maybe they put him against Grant. Dawson, who had a nice performance last week, but I think he really wants the win, especially coming off the loss, and the clearest path here is to wrestle, and if he does that, he should kind of move through Hooker. If he does just cater to the fans and keep this standing, I mean, Hooker's going to be very live, uh, but I 
hope if he does that early, he realizes it's probably not the path of least resistance. So much better grappler here, in my opinion. And uh, just a, a bit weird with this one. It, we did have this booked a little while ago. Uh, now receiving an international fight week. Um, Turner also with victories over Australians Jimmy Malarkey and Brad Riddell. Um, well, a little weird, but I, I don't know. I feel like he should have the edge over Hooker here. Um, I, I'm not sure if he's going to elect to grapple much in this fight. I think, you know, testing yourself against Hooker really would prove a point, help him up the rankings. And he was in a good spot in this division before uh, dropping that loss to, to Gamrot. So, I don't know. I think the ceiling is high for Turner. I'm not the highest on him either. Uh, but certainly this matchup with Hooker seems like one he should should be able to win. Agreed. All right. Opening the main card, we have Bo Nickel back in action, 4-0, uh, facing short notice replacement Valentin Woodburn. Bo Nickel, a minus 2,800 favorite up against Woodburn here on Saturday. Nick, what are your thoughts on this matchup? Are you pulling the trigger with uh, Valentin Woodburn? No, I'm not. Uh, Bo Nickel probably in round one, probably via submission. I mean, Val Woodburn is built like a little fire hydrant. He is going to be tough to take down, but at the same time, Bo Nickel, one of the best wrestlers to ever grace the octagon. Um, the UFC is not going to put him on this card opener to lose. They, there is a reason that when Treshawn Gore called out that they're bringing in a somewhat similar opponent opponent in a wrestle boxer wrestler boxer excuse me who's not really capable of hanging in the wrestling with nickel so i don't know i think nickel i mean they're handling him with kid gloves but we know that's what they like to do with their super prospects this is barely a step up um from jamie pickett but it is a fight on short notice for this val woodburn fellow and i did watch some film i mean you see he's powerful he's got really solid strikes i mean nickel we haven't seen his striking defense tested at all, but I don't think we're going to here either. I mean, outside of some flash KO uh, that would happen instantly, I think Nichols going to just dominate here, uh, take this fight to the mat immediately, work for that submission as he often does. Um, but yeah, I mean, he's also the biggest favorite in UFC history. So I don't know. There's really not that much nuance to this one. Not only is he taking on an inferior opponent, um, he's also taking a fight on a full camp where his opponent is taking it on very short notice. So I'm all over nickel here. Uh, Woodburn was actually drinking a beer when he was told about this fight. Um, he had over 20 pounds to cut. It sounds like he will make weight, but it sounds like most of his focus has just been on making this weight at 185. So uh, nickel should roll here, but that's not exactly a hot take. Uh, Face-offs at the press conference not too long ago. Nickel looks huge. Nickel, the, all of five inches, six inches taller than Woodburn. Um, I think he may jump the back here, just given the size he has over him. Why Why waste the energy with single leg, double leg? We've seen the jiu-jitsu from Nickel um, coming along very quickly and, and just as good as his offensive wrestling. Um, he's going to get this done, though. I mean, Woodburn, I've, I've watched him from as well throwing high kicks and falling on his back like um not 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 the most uh dialed in of these prospects um he was slated to fight on contender series later this summer and you know a seven and a record it, it makes sense that they bring him in this spot kind of you know uh build up the hype for you know perhaps the more casual fans but uh, nicholas should cruise here um minus 20, 2800 is ridiculous um minus minus 280 in round one i actually have walked in on nickel that's 10 times better than his just straight money line price move, uh, yeah. I, I, yeah i i think he's going to get it done early probably early submission but i i wouldn't want to bet one way or the other on the type of finish um i see him getting this guy out of there in the, in the first five minutes it should be a fight that he cruises um and i would have said the same thing against established ufc uh fighter and a, a ufc fight winner Trayshawn Gore. So, um, yeah, it's all more nickel today. Get value one way or another, under one and a half, or, uh, you know, around one. Um, uh, nickel should roll. Agreed. All right. The preliminary card will start 8 p.m. on Saturday. It uh, is headlined by the featured prelim of Robbie Lawler and Nico Price at Walter Waite. Um, Nick, your thoughts here with Robbie Lawler announcing uh, this to be his final fight in the UFC? Yeah, Lawler's an absolute legend. I mean, you know I've been watching this sport for decades at this point. And, I mean, there I've had a mixed uh, relationship with Robbie. I mean, back when he was fighting Diaz, like, I don't know. He, he's a guy you love to hate until you 
really just can't help but love him. Um, just a fighter's fighter, always down to bite on that mouthpiece, former welterweight champion in the UFC, former elite XC middleweight champion. Um, he's competed in every promotion. I mean, he's even fought in pride. Um, just if you want to show some of the history of mixed martial arts, like th this many years in, like 20, 30 years in, uh, Robbie Lawler's career is a big part of that. And all the fans love him. He's a soft-spoken guy. He spent a lot of time in Hawaii. He's kind of adopted that kind of mindset of just everything's chill. It is what it is, to quote Max Holloway. Um, just really laid-back guy. Um, but, yeah, at this point in his career, he's going to be difficult to back here. I mean, Nico Price, also a guy who's getting up there in age, a guy who's taking a lot of damage. Um, but at the same time, I mean, also with Nico Price, who's been training with Ben Askren, which is very strange. I mean, Askren and Lawler had that fight when uh, the UFC traded Mighty Mouse um, to 1FC to acquire Ben Askren, and Lawler knocked him out like two or three times. Uh, good old Herb Dean decided not to call the fight, uh, and Ben woke up and somehow got the finish. Totally ridiculous result, but all that being said, I mean, Nico did say he got some good tips from him coming into this fight. Um, he is a considerable favorite. I'm seeing 220 on some books as wide as 280 on others. Um, I do think that's getting a little bit out of hand, but at the same time, I mean, We've seen Lawler recently getting knocked out by Brian Barberina. Price has more power, in my opinion, than a Barberina. And if Price is going to wrestle here, while Lawler certainly has good takedown defense, I don't think that's going to be well for his cardio. And how rare is it that we see a fighter in their retirement fight actually win or look great? It's so, so, so rare. So as much as I want to back Robbie here as a dog, and I do think Price is the type of fighter that has enough holes in his game that it's not an insane thing to do, um, I think it would just be irresponsible to back him just off a of hard play uh, I think my head is telling me Nico probably gets it done here. Um, he's got seven miles to feed. He's got a lot of kids. Uh, he gets double the pay if he wins this fight. Um, so, yeah, I do like Nico Price here, who usually does fight to the level of his opponent. So Lawler should look good early here, but we've seen Lawler fade um, in a lot of his recent fights. And while Price hasn't held up great, he does seem to come alive at times in the later rounds. So I think Nico Price gets it done here. Um, of all these guys in the two to three hundred range, like talking money line, he's certainly not one of my more confident plays. I would love to see Robbie just put him out and go out into the sunset off a nice KO, but it seems fairly unlikely. Um, Price, while hittable, relatively durable, um, and yeah, it, it's just there's nothing that I've seen from Robbie lately that tells me he's going to pull it off here other than me wanting him to. So I'm going to take price uh, reluctantly. I don't love the price, uh, no pun intended on the money line, but I do think Nico gets it done. I kind of view it as a, you know, appropriately lined, maybe even um, some value on the Lawler side, you know, while the, while the recent, you know, fights haven't been that spectacular, he doesn't seem to be declining at a, you know, crazy rate. Um, he's just fight, he's been fighting once per year the, the past three and I mean the appearances haven't been all that awful um, the fight against Barbarino it was really back and forth in that first round it was just Lawler getting flipped and, and put out in the second that ended that fight um, I think that's what's giving me pause on uh, backing him here I think Nico is going to be faster and uh, the fresher fighter as rounds two and three begin um Lawler's looked a bit slower but he, he certainly still can catch these guys um you know outside the top 25 of the of the division and I, I think Nico you know um th this is the first southpaw he's faced since he's lost to Jeff Neal a, a fight that he lost by KO I think Lawler um you know can certainly get in the pocket and hit him a few times and you know we've seen Price hurt put out before so I, I don't think it's a crazy play to take Lawler here um I I also would love to see him win in his uh his retirement bout but yeah you, you have to figure Price is going to be the fresher um you know eight year edge uh in age um you know younger than Lawler um you should be able to extend him here and you know win this fight if, if he is able to get it into the latter half so um could be back and forth you know fight of the night style um that's what Lawler has given us his entire career um you know probably willing to go out on his shield here really throw down to the end um but I I think Price is going to be the pick for me as well although reluctant and uh certainly not somebody I'll be getting involved with at minus 220 or worse um but yeah N Nico Price the slight edge in this one. Agreed. We will now look at a welterweight matchup with Jack Della Maddalena taking on short notice replacement Josiah Harrell. Um, Della Maddalena had been booked to face Sean Brady on this card before um, Brady was forced to pull out due to a staff infection. And I am all over Della Maddalena this week per usual. I think this guy is um, 
is as legit as they get um, here in terms of prospect. Um, perhaps I'm ready to rate him the best boxer in the UFC. His hands are crazy. He has the snapping jab. He keeps the jab in your face. Sticky jab. Um, incredible volume with his lead hand. Um, great mixing shots to the body. Great finding the shot that he needs to put opponents down. We have seen him accrue first round finishes in four straight. I mean, in the UFC. Um, and and yeah, against this kid Harold, he's going to have a uh, an edge as good as any. Um, you know, getting in there, using his length, using his size. Um, he's much bigger than Harold. Harold fighting prior. Um, you know lightweight 160 pound catch weight i think his last time out um he, he's not nearly going to match up in terms of della madalena in terms of physical size madalena was also sucked out pretty bad uh, the last time he made the 170 pound weight class so take a look on the scales come friday but uh i don't think he has any issue making the weight um uh, certainly the much bigger and stronger though harold's not going to have any uh success grappling against somebody in madalena who has shown great counter wrestling and um yeah I, I really don't see him competing on the feet with della madalena we see madalena already in the first round start uh you know quality competition like randy brown um you know uh like danny roberts at, at least competition far superior than that of uh you know josiah harrell um uh, hailing from the ohio regional circuit I don't think he fares well in the spot. I think Della Maddalena finds the finish again in the first round, um, lighting him up with his hands. You, you don't want to miss this fight. If you have not seen Della Maddalena fight before, please tune in. Um, uh, this is one of my more confident plays. Him and Bo Nickel um, uh, should print money in, in, in this weekend in my eyes. Uh, your thoughts? Yeah, I think you're very bold uh, backing a minus 2,500 Bo Nickel and minus 1,000 Jack Della Maddalena. But I do agree with you. He should get it done here. I mean, Harold, if he is going to compete at the UFC level, it's probably down at lightweight. And that is a 15-pound jump up to welterweight. So, our fighter here. And while I am very high on Della Maddalena, as are you, I do think he could have trouble against some of the better wrestlers in the division. It's just he is not facing that here. Um, this Harold guy does seem to be a good grappler. A few wins from... Uh, back mount and things like that. Pretty good jujitsu player. But you got to remember, Della Manolina had a full camp for Sean Brady, who is one of the better grapplers in the division. I think he's going to come in here fully prepared for the style. Um, it is a short notice fight for both of them um, in that Della is getting a new opponent. But I really just think the style matches up well with what he'd been training for. Um, I, I honestly was going to consider Brady as an underdog here. Um, but that doesn't matter now. He's minus 1000 for a reason taking on a guy that probably shouldn't be fighting at welterweight taking this fight on short notice knows he's just kind of lamb to the slaughter so give me jack della here inside the distance i think that's another parlay parlay piece for folks that are watching and listening but totally agree this one shouldn't be close but it should be fun as long as it lasts um, think back to when della got pete rodriguez on short notice another undersized guy uh, who just kind of stood in there was willing to fight go out on his shield it was fun to watch but uh, probably was not fun for jack della madalina's opponent yeah i mean pete rodriguez face looked like mush and he was only in there <laughs> two minutes with the guy i mean exactly. Del, uh, he, he just tags you real quick i think he cruises again here puts on the show okay. um all right, women's straw weight. Uh, next, we have Yasmin Hauregi um, facing Denise Gomes. Um, yeah, Hauregi 10 and 0, uh, also an exciting prospect, just 24 years old. Um, fighting out of Entrum Gym, we, we have great representation this card, the uh, lower half of this card from Entrum Gym. And um, yeah, Reggie, a, a legit fighter, in my opinion. I mean, she's a, got really good boxing, um, great hands. You know, you'll see against, uh, you know, in this matchup, maybe not the power advantage that, uh, you know, the Brazilian opposite her does have. But um, I consider this sort of like a puncher's chance for the oncoming Gomes. Um, how Reggie just really clean with her boxing, able to slip in and out of the pocket well. Um, landing thus far uh, 6.3 significant strikes per minute in UFC competition. And uh, yeah, just going to be able to put on the volume, uh, light up Gomes for the majority of this bout. Um, We've seen Yael Reggie, you know, uh, you know, really put it on girls before. I could see her earning a finish in the spot. Um, I'm not sure I'll involve myself a ton here at minus 380 odds. There's there's other guys I'm more confident in, Whitaker, Volkanovski, but um, I, I do see Yael Reggie as good money this weekend. I'm, I'm just not sure if uh, I'll be as involved with some better spots, in, in my opinion, on this card. Um, a lot of big favorites. But she does seem good in terms of women's MMA and uh, in terms of the confidence of the picks I usually make. So uh, I like her here. 
Yeah, um, this is International Fight Week. They are looking to build prospects. I do expect Uregi is one of those. Um, I will say this. There's a couple fights that we're about to go over that I need to spend a little bit more time watching film, digging in. Um, I do remember Denise Gomes' win in her debut, but I haven't given her the due diligence she deserves. So I do want to spend a little more time there. But I am also very high on Uregi. Excellent boxer. I mean, this girl is just massive for a straw weight which is kind of an oxymoron kind of a funny thing to say uh, but she's jacked i mean really strong getting all those good mexican supplements um i don't know i think they're putting more and more money behind her now now that she's in the ufc and finding these wins and this seems like a fight that she should be able to win pretty convincingly uh, mostly on the feet where she'll keep it standing and be landing the better strikes at higher volume showing better defense um she is willing to get into brawls as we saw in that debut against lucindo um which could like you said play into Gomes's strengths here if Gomes does have some decent power but I don't know I don't see it I think the USC really wants to build um, their undefeated Mexican prospect here in a strawweight division that could certainly use some new blood so I like Uregi here I think she gets it done um, wouldn't mind tying her into parlays but I say that with a bit of some pause I do want to spend a little bit more time just researching Gomes seeing if she does have a chance here but for now I think Uregi's the pick I think the narrative kind of speaks for itself I have to agree with you on that one. And uh, now on to the last fight of our preliminary card, a light heavyweight rematch between Jimmy Crute and Alonzo Menafield. You're shaking your head. You didn't like the first uh, matchup between these two. <laughs> and a, a, an exciting draw. Yeah, I mean, it was fun, but it was like fun for the wrong reasons. Both these guys made terrible mistakes. I mean, Crude's certainly the better grappler, spent way too much time in the pocket with a much better striker in Menafield. Menafield, when he had Crude on skates, would engage in the clinch. It was like, who is the lower fight IQ? And the judges were like, honestly, fun fight, guys, but neither of you deserve to win. That's how I kind of perceive things. Um, I mean, watching it back, you know, I was on crew the first time around. I think he has a very clear path here if he leans on his grappling. I think he's the better grappling. He should be able to take this fight to the mat. But do I trust him to do it? I don't know. Based on that last fight, not really. And I mean, Minefield, I mean, he did enough to keep the fight standing as long as he needed to find the finish. But anytime he got close, he engaged in clinch again. So I don't know. I think Crute is the younger fighter who's going to improve more out of these two since the last time they fought. I'm probably going to back him again here, um, but I have zero confidence this time. And last time when these guys matched up, I thought Crew was going to dice through him and submit him on the mat relatively easily. Um, Alonzo Minafield leaving Fortis MMA to train under the tutelage of one Pat Barry, not someone I'm very high on in terms of fighting or uh, coaching for that matter. So I don't know. I like Crew to get it done here. Do I want to play him at near even odds maybe um but at the same time i mean just re-watching that last fight it's like how can you put money on either of these guys and feel good about it just two low fight iq fighters in what should be another fun war but who really knows i mean i don't know based on last time i think it's a little goofy they're remaking this fight but it was fun i mean the crowd's going to be going wild they do have a live crowd here so um it should play into that but I don't know. It's just tough to have confidence on either side, but Crute did show outstanding durability against a very, very dangerous puncher in Alonzo Manifield. It's just grapple, dude. Just only grapple. Don't do not do anything else, but I don't know that I trust him to do so. Maybe I, I, I have enough film on this one, but I want to dig into some interviews maybe. I think maybe we can catch some game plan bits from Crute, and maybe I could get a little bit more confident, but as things stand, I wouldn't put money on either of these guys based on that first performance. Yeah, and in terms of this fight IQ, I feel like I'm screaming at the TV every time Crude fights. Just shoot, because his, his grappling's great. I mean, um, he, he really does have the advantage there over most guys in the 205-pound division. Um, we did see him shoot for the takedown in the first minute, minute and a half of that first fight with Menafield. So that gives me a little confidence. He's going to look to get the grappling going again here early. He did get him down, got on top. Uh, but Menafield was able to escape, which is obviously the concern um, as these two run it back. I, I hope Kurt shoots again in the first minute, but again, you never really know. Um, one would think that has to be his game plan. He doesn't want to eat more of those shots from Menafield that got him on skates, got him dropped right before um, the, the first round had ended. Um, but yeah, I, I think Kurt's the slight lean for me. This is a real coin flip, though. Um, maybe consider the draw at 60 to 1. But, uh... <laughs> 60 to 1. Okay. <laughs> Could lightning strike twice. Uh, um, yeah. 
We'll, we'll yeah, and I do want to say too. I think Crew kind of gassed out chasing that finish early, and that was a, a big reason why the fight stayed so close. But again, you're always screaming at the TV with this guy. I agree with that uh, statement there. Yeah, yeah, should be should be a fun one though. Uh, well, let's hope it's a little uh, cleaner than the last time. Um, the early preliminary portion of the night, we have a uh, a now listen here, catchweight. Is this a catchweight? Not one twenty five. I thought we were running. Uh, I don't know. It might be 125. They might have agreed at 130 because Chavez is taking it on like one week's notice. But okay, yeah, Shair has uh, you know, two pro losses by submission heading into this one, 10 and four as a pro. Um, you know, we, we've seen him before in in fights. I did get a little study in for him. Um, some work off his back, some decent grappling of his own. Um, it's just he's fighting, you know, another uber prospect here on International Fight Week in Tatsuro Tyra, um, a phenomenal grappler. We've seen him execute great body lock takedowns already in the UFC. He gets fights to the mat. Uh, it appears, you know, uh, whenever needed. And, um, yeah, the grappling from this guy uh, at these lower weight classes is a problem. Um, we see him have immense top control, the ability to finish fights, and, um, yeah, locking up a sixth submission of um, uh, Chaya's teammate, Jesus Aguilar, who also fights on this card, um, there his last time out. So um, I, I think at minus 1,000, certainly uh, Tyler's not somebody I'm as confident in in someone like Della Madalena on this card. Um, still a young kid, 23 years old. Um, a lot of room to grow, but clearly the grappling edge in this fight. I think uh, Shaira's, um short notice, too, is going to be an uphill battle. Um, you'll want to see him, you know, get his hands on Tyra. Uh, really hurt him in the early going of this fight, but I do imagine if Tetsuro Tyra gets him down onto the mat, um, it's going to be a wrap as it was when he fought um, Aguilar. So I'd imagine Tyra by submission is uh, going to be the best play on this fight, probably the way that I attack uh, this matchup. But um, yeah, I, I think he's a legit prospect, and you know it's a shame we're getting this matchup against you know one of these lower level guys that I expect him to slice through. Yeah, he was supposed to fight Clayton Rodriguez a couple weeks back. But That'd be good. Wait. Yeah, that would yeah. have been a fun one for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, I will give Shaurez some credit. I mean, he is a decent striker. He's pretty aggressive and can be dangerous on the feet, pretty dynamic in what he throws. Um, so I don't think Tyra wants to spend too much time standing with him. Um, and funnily enough, uh, Shaurez's two most recent ones have come via submission. Obviously, I don't think he's going to have that path here. Um, he could be dangerous if he keeps his standing. We've seen Tyra kind of not the best striker striking defense really um, but I don't really think it matters Tyra should slice through him on the mat get another submission win under his belt and hopefully they bring him back soon against someone more competitive um, I think you could tie him in a parlays inside the distance I agree with you that the submission is most likely um, you just got to worry about the ground and pound like if he can totally flatten him out and he's on his chest in the middle of the ring I mean well, who's to say he doesn't just punch the side of his head till someone like Chris Tayoni calls it really early or something like that so I like Tyra here I think submission is the best angle but I want to look at the prices. I think inside the distance tying him to parlays is probably the safe move. Um, the one thing I will say, if there is any reason to be afraid of Tyra here, he is cutting weight twice. We recently saw with Guru Kudaladze who did that. He was upset dramatically. Um, there was another fighter too. Uh, David Borak against Josh Van had a cut weight twice, upset dramatically. Um, bit of a trend forming here, but I don't think it matters in this stylistic matchup. I think Tyra should be fine, uh, but just definitely keep your eye on the weigh-ins. He's the young kid. Cutting weight twice isn't healthy for anyone, especially a big fighter at flyweight. But I do think he gets a good weight cut in, looks fine at uh, the ceremonials as well, and then uh, probably gets it done pretty quickly via submission. Yeah, and I, I can clarify, uh, 130 is uh, the catch weight for this bout. That's so, good I mean, for Tyra. Yeah, yeah, it certainly helps as well. Yeah, not not cutting that extra five pounds a second time. That's good, um, yeah. Yeah, should be good money. Should, should should make weight without issue, but uh, certainly check in come Friday. Um, next up, we have light heavyweights uh, Vitor Petrino taking on Marcy and Procneau. Um, Petrino closing from a minus three hundred down to minus two thirty at current. Um, uh, you know, I I think he should be good in this spot. We've seen um a couple of well rounded performance uh performances out of him the past few showings. Uh, you know uh putting on a, a bit of a show with his grappling chops last time out against Anton Turkholz. Didn't really expect to see him uh, winning that fight with uh, takedowns of his own, but landing more so than Turkholz was able, who is primarily a grappler. 
Um, Katrina, though, it's the heavy hands that, uh, you know, are going to be his key to victory in most fights. A big, strong, uh, bulky Brazilian that is going to have the power advantage over uh, most of the guys that he's facing. Um, Pac now in this stylistic matchup could go one of two ways. Um, we've seen him win fights before by fighting from the outside, landing higher volume than his opponents, controlling distance well. Um, you know, sort of that karate kickboxing mix that, um, you know, could play to his benefit in a fight that goes to decision. Um, but we also haven't seen him finish before. He not too long ago has finished three bouts consecutively. Um, I think somebody with the power of Petrino, if he is able to find the chin on uh, Marcin Pracnia, should be able to get the finish here on Saturday. But, um, you know, otherwise, Pracnia is a live dog, just um, staying on the outside, lasting the full 15 minutes. Um, I just think Petrino is going to be able to get in range at some point. He's not the highest volume. Um, he's somebody who's willing to wait, kind of, you know, sit, find his shots. But um, I do believe that Prakna is going to be ahead in this fight. He's going to be landing at a uh, considerable clip and leaving himself open for more of the counters from the uh, bigger and more powerful Petrino. So um, I'm not loving this spot. I probably won't bet too heavily on Petrino unless these odds continue to close. Um, but I do think he gets the win here, likely finishing uh, Marcin Prakna. Yeah, this is another one where the line feels a little bit too wide. Um, I do think Petrino's the side. I think the UFC wants to build him. Again, another undefeated prospect. Looked good last time out against Turkaj, and he answered a lot of questions that I had about him as far as his cardio was concerned. Um, coming into the UFC, most of his wins by very quick and nasty finish, but we saw that when he's extended, I mean, he could still carry that power late in rounds. He can grapple. He can remain effective for 15 minutes, which obviously at this level is very important. Uh, Practio, I mean, coming off that weird fight against William Knight where William Knight just stood there, Practio just threw like 40 high kicks in one, one of the worst fights of 2023, but Ever. I don't know. Yeah, practically ever. I mean, practically although, like, he's got wins against Roundtree. He, he's lost to some terrible competition as well. Mike Rodriguez knocked him out with El Sam Alvey. Sam Alvey's never a great win. Um, albeit, when he did lose to Alvey, it was at least when Alvey was a little bit better than he was towards the end of his career. But regardless, Sam Alvey slander aside, I, I do think Petrino's aside here. I just don't know that I love the price. Um, I think the UFC is setting him up to get a win, hopefully by KO. Uh, but there are a lot of fighters in this range on this card, like these minus 200, 300s. And this is one of the ones I'm less confident in, just because Brock Neal has been in there. He has been in front of the crowd. He has been in front of the lights. Um, so, yeah, I'll go ahead. I'll probably pick Petrino. Probably think he gets it done by KO in the first or second round. But is this one going to shock me if he doesn't? And Prakneo could make it boring, kind of close distance, grind him up against the cage, control position there, make it another terrible fight to watch and pull off the upset? No, wouldn't be surprised at all. But I do think Petrino gets it done probably inside the distance. All right. I have to uh, agree there. And now on to a bantamweight matchup between Cameron Simon and uh, Terrence Mitchell. Um, Simon, teammate of Vrikas Duplessis, also representing South Africa. A, another hype prospect at 8-0 and o as a professional. Um, kid seems pretty good. I mean, 22 years old, um, certainly durable. Um, we saw him overcoming adversity in his last fight, um, you know, uh, ha having to score well in the third round to secure victory after... Well, it was sort of a weird back and forth with, uh, you know, groin kicks, eye pokes. Um, he, he's pretty uh, good grappler, uh, mixing it with his kickboxing skills. I think here in a fight against a uh, big, lanky bantamweight like Terrence Mitchell, um, we should see Simon finding the edge striking uh, for the most part. Um, his hooks and, you know, the pressure that he's often able to employ when moving forward should get to a guy like Mitchell, who is, uh, you know, cu coming in here, not necessarily with a resume to match with somebody like, uh, like Cameron Simon. Um, I, I think that I still want to dig a bit more into, uh, uh, Mitchell here in this spot, but one would fear Simon to be a, uh, a, you know, quite comfortable in securing the victory. I just don't think 550 is really warranted at, at, at this time, at this point, um, given his career trajectory so far, we've seen Simon a large favorite and fighting more competitively than the, that price tag. So um, before I'm going to recommend anyone go ahead and hammer this kid here, um, certainly want to dig a bit more into this fight. But one would figure he gets the job done. We've seen him, um, you know, look, look really crisp everywhere. Um, a well-rounded prospect at just 22 years of age. 
Yeah, so I was going to fade Simon here if he still had the matchup with Christian Rodriguez. I um, thought Rodriguez was a really tough matchup for him. Rodriguez injured, forced to pull out. Now we're getting, getting Terrence Mitchell. Um, he was on the Ultimate Fighter, knocked out by Kai Carr of France. Um, he's been winning ever since on the Alaskan regional scene, which is notoriously one of the worst. Um, not many wins over guys with more than like four professional victories, fighting a lot of guys that probably would never even sniff the UFC. And it's a bit surprising to see Mitchell getting the call here. But once again, and it's a bit of a narrative on this card, uh, they, they needed a short notice opponent to put in against the prospect. I mean, they were going to have prospect first prospect, um, Simon against Rodriguez, who took out Raul Rojas, who obviously the UFC was behind. I thought they were going to kind of build this little prospect killer narrative with C-Rod, who's actually pretty young himself. Um, but yeah, we don't have that anymore. So I don't know why I'm spending so much time talking about it. Cam Simon, I mean, the one issue with him is what you mentioned. I mean, he commits a lot of fouls, nut shots, eye pokes, things like that. And I don't think it's because he's trying to. I think he's just very raw in his abilities. But if you're backing someone at this price and he's going to give points away on the cards and it goes the distance, um, I mean, it could be a lot closer than it needs to be. So while I do like Simon here, I do think it gets it done. I love to fade the Alaskan regional scene. Um, we're getting that opportunity here. I don't love the price, um, but I do like Simon. Not my favorite parlay piece, uh, but he should be able to roll here against a guy who's making his UFC debut at 33 years old. Um, really hasn't been facing good competition. And the one time he did, Kai Kara France really uh, just knocked him off the ultimate fighter immediately. So I like, like a second. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think he gets it done. I think he's a bit overrated. Like I said, I would have loved to place you right against him, but in this, op this matchup, this opportunity, he should roll. Yeah. Tend to agree. Um, 550 again, maybe too rich for me, but I, th I think he does get the job done. Um, Flyweights again here with uh, Jesus Aguilar taking Shannon Ross on. Um, Aguilar, the minus 140 favorite at Corinne against Ross, plus 120. Um, still got to dig into this one a bit, but I think Ross is pretty live. Um, you know, 34 years old. We've seen his chin check the past two fights, but, uh, you know, he, he is solid. I think he could, you know, mix in grappling a bit more uh, often in fights as needed, but um, his hands are solid. And I think against a fighter like Aguilar, um, he's going to be able to put on a better show. Aguilar doesn't necessarily have the power some of Ross's previous opponents have. Um, he was fighting really good prospects in Venetia Salvador and Clayton Rodriguez. Um, I don't think Aguilar is really that guy. And um, yeah, again, coming off the loss to Tatsura Tyra, I don't think Aguilar is going to be um, rushing to get any fights to the mat. Um, likely content to, here to try and chin check Shannon Ross yet again, but we've seen Ross have dogged pressure, um, good volume over the course of his fights, landing at current uh, more than six and a half significant strikes per minute. And uh, yeah, getting a plus money on him in the spot. I mean, a card full of Aussies as well. Um, perhaps some crowd support behind him. I do think he is live in the spot. I'm not that tempted to, uh, you know, pull the trigger. Just 34-year-old coming off back-to-back, -back, you know, knockout losses is never really going to be a uh, plus EV play in my eyes. But uh, certainly if I were to give a point pick in this point of the week, um, Ross would be the lean for me. Yeah, I'm a bit shocked this fight's even on the card. I mean, we got a lot of prospect building, a lot of really high-level stuff, and then we have this one. Um, Shannon Ross, one of the only guys to ever get a UFC contract coming off a loss on Contender Series. Uh, we saw him spark last time out against Clayton Rodriguez. Certainly a vet with some experience, does a good job putting up volume on the feet. Really fun fighter to watch, and that he's kind of kill or be killed. Um, the issue is he doesn't really carry a ton of power, and he doesn't have a great chin. Um, it does seem like the UFC is doing him a favor here against Aguilar, a fighter who's never won a fight via KO, but also a fighter who may have an advantage on the mat. So I'm with you in that. This is one of the fights I haven't spent a ton of time on, uh, but it's very low level. And whenever you're dealing with lower level fights on these really stacked cards, um, it's usually wise to just kind of put your money somewhere else. Uh, there's always volatility when you go down in level. And I think that's where we're going to get here. I think off that alone, you can maybe play the underdog uh, as this line does get wider. People are building parlays and tying in Aguilar just because they see a big number. Um, there's certainly some upside from just playing numbers. Uh, but yeah, really, I don't know. I want to spend some time with this. I mean, if Shannon Ross could keep it standing, he should be the better striker. But at the same time, I mean, how do you back a guy who just really hasn't looked all that good, at, albeit against elite competition? Um, but yeah, I, I do think he's a live underdog. I guess he's my lean for now as well. But at the same time, I have trouble really confidently backing either of these two. 
All right, and uh, if if not, Shannon Ross plus one twenty. Your thoughts on Kim Walla Kirk plus one twenty. Um, opening up the card here at lightweight against Esteban Ribovic. This one's a little higher level. Um, uh, any opinions here? Yeah, certainly. I mean, I like Kirk. Um, I thought he was live. He was down fighting at featherweight. Jackson, obviously a really good fighter, was able to take him out via submission late in that one. But Kirk, well-rounded, really good cardio, underrated wrestler in my opinion. Um, Ribovich has had trouble with grapplers in the past, so I do actually think Kirk's alive. Uh, maybe for the upset here, if you could mix in that grappling. Um, on the feet, both these guys are pretty dangerous. Both a lot of wins via KO. Uh, should be a fun one. Really fun fight to open the card. But I can't make a confident play until I spend a little bit more time on this one as well. I'm um, spending a ton of time this week on some of the bigger fights and the bigger matchups. And I think rightfully so. Um, but at the same time, I do want to make sure we get the right picks out to our Dine subscribers. So just make sure anyone listening or watching um, who does follow us on Twitter or just on the Dine's website, uh, keep it eye out for that article Saturday morning where we'll have our final picks um, not only who we're picking for each fight but how we expect them to win this is another one I don't want to say where I'm at currently if I were to pick it right now gun to my head it would be Kirk probably be a decision um, but this should be a really fun fight uh, two guys who like to come forward Kirk probably the more well-rounded of the two but Rebovich probably a bit more dynamic of a striker so really good matchup I do think there's value on Kirk as an underdog but not a fight I'm confident in either side quite yet yeah, and I uh, I feel a bit similar. I mean, at this point in the week, I'm not ready to give a pick on this fight. I do feel pretty confident saying uh, ha how we'll see it play out, though. Um, a pretty competitive back and forth. I think Rebovic is the much better boxing. Um, I really like his hooks to the body. I, I like the uh, output he's able to throw on the feet. I think he is going to be able to uh, land at a higher clip than Kirk is when these two are standing. Um, but Kirk does well moving forward, um, pushing the pace, pressuring his opponents, and then obviously, um, you know, scoring takedowns as needed off of those. Um, I don't know if he's going to be rushing to grapple here, but as you said, Rebovich has had some issues before when it comes to his defensive grappling acumen. Um, I see him getting put on his back a couple of times in this fight. It'll, it'll just really depend how timely those takedowns are from Kirk. And um, I think most importantly, who's going to be the fresher fighter in, uh, in the latter half of this one. If, if these two are standing late, I think Rebovich is, uh, is going to look better just landing the boxing combinations more second nature to him um, than someone like Kirk, who, you know, isn't quite as clean in terms of his, you know, technical boxing skills. So um, no official pick for me, slightly into Rebovich here on the opener, but um, yeah, it should be a good way to start out the card. Um, Nick, I appreciate as always you joining me to break down the event this weekend. UFC 290 um, should be a very good one. You know, July starts and finishes with some awesome uh, pay-per-view cards and uh, some great fights in between as well. Um, as always, be sure to check out our write-up Saturday morning on Dine Sports um, for our official pick for every fight here. And uh, Nick, again, thank you for joining me. Excited for the fights this weekend. Thank you, man. Looking forward to it. Good luck, everyone. Take care.